In 1915, Dr. Arthur Keith wrote, Of the various problems relating to extinct forms of man, none is of greater interest than that which concerns Homo neanderthalensis. This peculiar and extinct species of man appeared in Europe about the commencement of the Musterian cultural period, and all traces of him vanished towards the close of that period. Where he came from and where he finally disappeared we do not know. Hence, every additional fact we can collect about him is of value. New discoveries at Xuchang and Longtan in China are causing a revision of Neanderthal history. The East was not empty or an evolutionary dead end. It was a meeting ground where Neanderthals, Denisovans, and early modern humans crossed paths, traded genes and technology, and adapted to subtropical Asia. If you walked through the misty subtropical forests of what is now southern China 60,000 years ago, you might expect to hear gibbons whooping from the canopy and to glimpse a solitary orangutan moving slowly among the strangler figs. What you would not expect, because we have been taught to picture them on cold European steppes, is to meet a band of Neanderthals. Yet a startling archaeological discovery from the Long Tan site in southwest China has forced scientists to reconsider where these Ice Age humans roamed. Stone tools unearthed there are crafted in the Kina style, a technology long regarded as a cultural fingerprint of Neanderthals thousands of miles away in Europe. If the hands that made them really belonged to Neanderthals, then during one of the Pleistocene's warmer, wetter interglacials, they were pushing far beyond their supposed eastern boundary, deep into Asian forests alive with apes. It is an image that upends our mental map. Neanderthals not only hunting mammoths on frozen plains, but moving through subtropical valleys, hearing the cough of gibbons, and perhaps catching sight of a red-haired orangutan high above. For more than a century, the Neanderthal story has been told as a Western Eurasian one. Their first fossils appeared in Europe about 400,000 years ago, and for decades researchers thought their range stopped somewhere east of the Caspian. Later discoveries pushed that frontier into Siberia. Neanderthal bones and DNA from Denisova Cave in the Altai Mountains proved that they once lived as far as Central Asia about 200,000 to 50,000 years ago. But the Altai became a conceptual wall. Beyond it, the narrative belonged to other humans, late Homo erectus remnants, Denisovans, and eventually modern Homo sapiens expanding from the south. The long-term discovery cracks that neat boundary. In reddish silts at the southwestern edge of the Tibetan Plateau, archaeologists uncovered hundreds of scrapers, notched tools and stout points, all made with the distinctive long-use, heavily retouched Kina approach. The Kina method is more than a flaking style. It signals a whole survival system shaped by scarcity and mobility. In Ice Age Europe, Neanderthals used quina scrapers during cold open woodland phases about 60,000 to 50,000 years ago, designing tools meant to be resharpened again and again as they followed migrating reindeer, bison and horses. The long tan tools show the same logic. Thick, rejuvenated scrapers and predictably prepared cores, suggesting long-distance forays across patchy resources. Yet pollen analysis shows that Longtan's landscape was not a treeless steppe, but a cool, forested, humid plateau margin. It would have been a mosaic of riverine woods and open clearings, rich in deer and pigs, and alive with primates. Fossils and historical records show that orangutans roamed Yunnan and Guangxi well into the late Pleistocene, some surviving until about 10,000 years ago, alongside macaques, langurs, and gibbons. To picture Neanderthals here is to imagine them not on a bleak mammoth plain, but under a dripping green canopy, firelight flickering on their heavy brows, while apes moved silently in the branches. That image challenges the old stereotype of Neanderthals as cold-adapted specialists unable to cope with new biomes. Genetics and archaeology have been steadily dismantling that view. We now know Neanderthals lived on Mediterranean coasts, exploited marine foods, foraged in oak savannas and steppe, and endured rapid climate swings. Longtan stretches that adaptability eastward into subtropical Asia. The tools are dated to roughly 60,000 to 50,000 years ago, a time of climate oscillations. These were not full glacials, but alternating cold and mild pulses that opened forest corridors across southern China. 
Such windows could have lured small Neanderthal bands out of their core western range, following game through river valleys like the Salween and Mekong toward Yunnan. The question is who exactly made these tools? The Long Tan researchers outline two possibilities. One is literal. Neanderthals themselves journeyed thousands of miles eastward and established at least temporary camps in Yunnan. The other is convergent. Denisovans, or another archaic Asian population, independently reinvented the Kina method because similar environments demanded similar solutions. As one of the study's authors put it, stone tools are not ID cards. Without bones or DNA, technology alone cannot name the makers. But there are compelling hints that Neanderthals were closer to China than once believed. Fossils from Denisova Cave prove they reached the Altai. And in central China's Hainan province, a remarkable discovery blurred the east-west divide, the Shuchang skulls. These two partial crania, dating to about 105,000 to 125,000 years ago, have a mix of features that stunned paleoanthropologists. Their vaults are large, with brain sizes around 1,800 cubic centimeters, well within or above modern human range. Yet the back of the skulls shows the characteristic bun-like projection and elongated shape of Neanderthals, and their inner ear and semicircular canal morphology also echoes Western Neanderthals. At the same time, the faces, now mostly missing, were likely flatter, closer to archaic East Asians. The Suchang finds suggest a population in central China with significant Neanderthal ancestry or close ties, perhaps migrants from the West who mixed with local archaic humans or hybrids of Neanderthals and Denisovan-like Asians. They are physical proof that Western and Eastern lineages met somewhere in China during the last interglacial. Understanding those skulls means understanding the habitat ranges of these archaic humans. Neanderthals evolved in Western Eurasia but were never limited to ice. Fossils and sites trace them from the Atlantic to the Altai, Iberia, France, Germany, the Balkans, the Levant, the Caucasus, the Iranian Plateau, Siberia. They tolerated cold steppe, Mediterranean scrub, temperate forests, and even high altitudes. Denisovans, by contrast, are known only from a handful of sites, but with clues suggesting a broad eastern range. Their DNA is in modern populations from Siberia to Southeast Asia and New Guinea, implying they once occupied huge swaths of Asia. Fossils at Denisova Cave show Denisovans present from at least 200,000 years ago. A jawbone from Baishia Cast Cave on the Tibetan Plateau proves they thrived at 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet, some 160,000 years ago. Where these two worlds met is exactly the question the Xuchang skulls raise. Central China sits at a plausible ecological crossroads. During warm interglacials, 120,000, 100,000, and 80,000 years ago, temperate forests and savannas could connect the steppe west to the subtropical east, allowing Neanderthal groups to wander in and meet Denisovans. The long tan tools fit neatly into that picture. They appear long after the Xuchang individuals lived, but could represent a late echo of west-east contact. If Neanderthals reached the Altai, then warm phases could have pulled some of them even farther into the Chinese highlands, where they or their mixed descendants left behind a familiar toolkit. Conversely, if Denisovans had long occupied these forests, they may have borrowed or reinvented a proven Neanderthal technology during cold spells when resources grew patchy. Either way, the cultural boundary between Europe and East Asia was more porous than once thought. The surrounding environment reinforces how strange this would look to a Eurocentric eye. Interglacial southern China was lush, with broadleaf evergreens, conifers, and rich river systems. Deer, pigs, and forest bovids roamed. So did a spectacular primate guild. Gibbons and langurs were abundant. Orangutans persisted far north of today's islands, with fossils across Guangxi, Yunnan, and even farther east into Shandong until the terminal Pleistocene and the ghost of Gigantopithecus still lingered in the fossil record. A Neanderthal hunter here would share the landscape with several other large-brained, socially complex primates. Our textbooks imagine Neanderthals among woolly rhinos and mammoths, but in Yunnan they might have been skinning deer under trees, 
where an orangutan female cradled her infant and a troop of macaques scolded from the canopy. This mental shift matters because it widens our sense of Neanderthal ecology. They were not merely cold specialists. They were generalists with a toolkit able to bridge biomes. Their possible presence in China during an interglacial also intersects with their genetic legacy. Modern East Asians carry Neanderthal DNA, but some of it looks subtly different from the segments in Europeans, implying more than one wave of contact. A late eastward expansion that reached places like Yunnan could explain that pattern. Small, forest-adapted Neanderthal groups mixing with Denisovans or early modern humans. The long tan find also contributes to a bigger revaluation of East Asia. For decades it was dismissed as a Paleolithic backwater, assumed to have lagged technologically. But sophisticated Levallois and now Quina industries show that local humans were innovating in parallel with the West. Smithsonian anthropologists call discoveries like Long Tan part of a reversal of the backwater narrative, proving that Eastern populations were as behaviorally dynamic and complex as their Western cousins. This matters for understanding modern human arrival. Homo sapiens did not enter a cultural vacuum when they reached East Asia around 50,000 to 40,000 years ago. They met seasoned toolmakers. Climate was the invisible hand opening and closing those doors. In full glacials, deserts and tundra cut China off. But during interglacials when the Xuchang people lived, or the milder climates when Longtan was occupied, green corridors linked Central Asia to the forests of the Yangtze and beyond. Rivers like the Yellow and Yangtze carved travel routes. Plateaus were milder and wetter. Neanderthal or hybrid groups could travel east, meet Denisovans, and then retreat or be absorbed when climate swung cold again. Technological convergence also deserves respect. If the long tan tools were made by Denisovans, it shows they were capable of the same curated strategies once considered uniquely Neanderthal. Either answer, migration or parallel invention, breaks the myth that Asia lagged behind or was sealed off. The old vision of isolated, stagnant eastern hominins is gone. Some Neanderthals may have even encountered remnant bands of Homo erectus in the jungles of East Asia and interbred with them thought we don't have DNA evidence yet. What would clinch the story as a fossil? A tooth or jaw with Neanderthal DNA or unmistakable anatomy would rewrite textbooks overnight. Ancient protein analysis may help if DNA is too degraded. Until then, archaeologists must balance possibilities. But the cultural signal is too clear to dismiss. A classic Western toolkit sits in southwest China at 60,000 to 50,000 years ago. Either the makers came from the West, or they were deeply influenced by those who did. Yet caution remains. The Long Tan team found no preserved animal bones, so we do not know the prey base. Quina tools in Europe were tied to hide processing and large ungulates. In Yunnan, the prey might have been forest deer, wild boar, or even primates. The scraper's curated design implies long-range foraging, perhaps following seasonal game corridors through mountains and valleys. That kind of mobility would bring repeated encounters with other primates, from gibbons to orangutans. Beyond scholarship, there is a humanizing effect in imagining Neanderthals in a Chinese rainforest. It expands them from the caricature of cold-weather cavemen into a truly Eurasian species, curious and adaptable, able to venture into primate-rich forests and survive. It also forces us to picture their world as teeming, not empty. These were not lonely bands. They shared space with Denisovans, with orangutans clambering above, with gibbons brachiating across river valleys. The Pleistocene East was a lively stage of primates meeting primates. Orangutans today cling to the last refugees of Borneo and Sumatra, and Neanderthals are gone. Yet once, perhaps during a mild pulse of the Ice Age, they may have met under the same canopy. One was an arboreal fruit-eater with deep orange hair and a contemplative face, the other a terrestrial hunter with curated scrapers and fire. Both were shaped by the same climate swings and the same need to adapt. The conventional picture of Pleistocene Asia waiting passively for modern humans is too simple. It was a land of innovation and encounter. The long-tan stones thus speak across sixty millennia.
They tell us that somewhere in interglacial southern China, under dripping leaves and among calling gibbons, a band of archaic humans shaped tough queener scrapers and lived far from Europe. Whether they were Neanderthals themselves, or Denisovans who had absorbed Neanderthal know-how, the effect is the same. Neanderthal culture reached into a forested land we never imagined for it, a land where great red apes swung through the trees. Added to the Shuchang skulls and the genetic evidence of overlapping Neanderthal and Denisovan ranges, this paints a deep past where boundaries were fluid, populations mixed, and ideas travelled far. It is a past where Neanderthals were not provincial, but pan-Eurasian, and where even in China's lush interglacials they may have looked up from a freshly retouched scraper and seen an orangutan watching silently from the green above. Please click on these videos to explore more about our shared human history.